Thanks, yes, we've had a great uh, welcome here in, is it Auckland? <laughs> well, yeah, we've been 10 days in Adelaide and Brisbane and here, so we don't really know what day it is or where we are or what time it is or anything, but um, what we, do, we do know that we had a wonderful uh, welcome here in Laidlaw and uh, we're grateful for that and it's been great meeting uh, people here. My first wife, Anne, had multiple sclerosis for 43 years and for the last 11 years was totally disabled. Uh, she couldn't walk or speak or swallow uh, and her disability made it hard for her to think or remember things. And it made me reflect on what it means to be human because um, as a theologian I can't help but think about questions. It's a disadvantage of being a theologian, you can't help but think about things. Uh, when people meet uh, the disabled or people with impairments, they sometimes instinctively treat them in a way that suggests that they subconsciously regard them as not quite the same sort of beings as the rest of us. And that applies to the physically disabled, but especially to people who are in some way uh, disabled in spirit or in mind. But my experience of living with Anne in her disability uh, led me to work instead with the conviction that when, as an ordinary person, I meet someone who's disabled, I meet a person who is different from me in an important way, but who is gen a genuinely and fully human being. There are analogies with what can happen when I meet somebody of a different race. I meet somebody else made in God's image, and their differentness contributes to my understanding of what it means to be human. And thus actually, given the idea of the image of God, contributes to my understanding of what it means to be God. Uh, and so uh, this afternoon, in, in the second of the two uh, talks that I give, I want to talk some more about what it means to be made in God's image uh, and what happens when I think about being made in God's image in light of disability uh, and what I think about and the way I think about disability uh, in light of our being made in God's image. Um, and I want to talk then, for instance, about uh, the way in which God making humanity in his image um, meant that we were given a share in God's governing of the world on God's behalf and that disabled people share in that and need to be uh, freed, facilitated, included uh, in that governing of the world on God's behalf. Uh, and I'll talk about how disabled people remind us um, of the fact that life is a journey, a becoming as well as, as, well as a being. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, Genesis talking about being made in God's image involving being male and female and saying things about relationships and I'll try and spell that out a bit. And then talk about how uh, an image is intrinsically something physical. Uh, made in God's image, we embody what God would be like if God were a physical person, which of course eventually God became. Um, and about the way in which disabled people have to deal with being physical uh, are less free to evade uh, the fact that we are as human beings intrinsically physical um, than the rest of us are. So I'll talk about, about all that more uh, this afternoon. But that, way of, but that by way of background to my talking this morning about uh, the, my own experience of living with somebody with a disability and with my understanding uh, of what it meant for Anne to be disabled. In, in the earlier years, she could tell, we, tell me, she, we could discuss it. In the last dozen years of her life, we couldn't do that because she couldn't um, talk about it. So it's kind of my story and kind of her story and the things that I'll say this morning indeed all, more or less all come from that uh, book, Remembering Anne, which uh, Rod has just referred to. It's just one person's story. It's my account of what happened. Uh, and uh, you, you, you may think that I misunderstand, that I'm wrong. Or, or, or maybe uh, this is what happened at Brisbane. I think that um, in, when, I gave it, when I gave this talk at Brisbane, some of the disabled people uh, present or the people who were involved with disability issues um, kind of didn't like what I said because it didn't correspond to their experience or to their priorities. So if you don't like what I say, that's okay. It's just what I say. It's, I'm, I'm reflecting on my own experience. I'm not saying that anybody else has to 
um, share that understanding of my experience, certainly not, that the way that they think of their disability is the way that, um, that, that their, the way they think of their disability has to correspond to the way that I think uh, of Anne and of her disability. It's just one person's story. I was married then for 42 years uh, to Anne. Um, we'd married 18 months after she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. For about the first third of that time, the MS was more a recurrent illness than a disability. During the middle third, uh, it was becoming more of an ongoing handicap, and for the last third, she was wheelchair bound. The time when I uh, moved from England to the United States 15 years ago to teach at Fuller Seminary uh, was the time, until that time, she'd been able still to get across her room uh, with a walking frame. But by the time we made the move to the United States, she couldn't do that anymore. And not long after that, she lost the ability to speak. Not because she was physically um, incapable of forming the words that she'd got in her mind, uh, but because she couldn't any longer formulate in her mind the things she wanted to say. Uh, she lost the ability to swallow at about the same time, and she would have died through malnutrition if she hadn't had a feeding tube. Of course, then, she couldn't look after herself in any way at all, and eventually she died um, three years ago, a week or two ago. Somehow, the way that Anne handled her experience of disability had a profound effect on many people, uh, not to say me. Here are two comments from the days after her death. The first of the comments relates to that middle period when we were still in England and when I was teaching um, at St. John's Theological College in Nottingham in England. It's from a student who, was, uh, who came to the, to, to the college at that time. Anne was a quiet yet somewhat revolutionary presence in St. John's, he said. I remember coming for interview and seeing the wheelchair lift on the stairs and immediately thinking, there's more to this place than the headlines, long before the church had thought very much about disability. I remember her delight at certain things and, her, uh, and the infectiousness of her laughter and her smile. And I remember seeing you and her together and watching the impact of life uh, at St. John's and of Anne's illness on you, that's me, and the holding of that within Christian community in creative as well as tough ways. Anne, for me, was one of the people who kept the place grounded when it became most hothouse-like. Seeing Anne at chapel or in meals helped me to hold things in proportion. And here's another statement uh, from those years after, those weeks after Anne died, from our time at Fuller. Significant riverbeds of progress and joy wind through my soul as a result of Anne Golden Gate. We are forever grateful that she paid the price of her discipleship because she stands tall in a very small group of fellow believers who have worked for our comfort and edification instead of harm. Her contribution to our, to our ministry is, without doubt, one of the greatest gifts we've ever received. Back to the beginning. As a young person, Anne had been lively and quick. She was one of the top students in her medical school. But later, as I've implied, the effect of the illness meant she sl slowed down a lot and could do less and less. From time to time, she would fret over her mothering and would recall the way that a nurse had declared in the early years of her diagnosis that she had no right to have children, would come home from work each day from her work as a psychiatrist, needing to offload the troubles and the worries of the situation at work. And she would pour them out as we sat at the table after dinner when the boys had gone off to play or to watch TV. I think it was a tricky time in my own work and I felt she wasn't interested in me and in my life and my needs. So that was the time when the illness started taking its toll of me uh, as well as of her. I had trouble sleeping, I think. Um, I think she maybe took sleeping pills. Uh, I, but I would get up in the middle of the night and sit on the sofa and cry out to God about it. Uh, I couldn't imagine then how I could continue coping with the burden of living with her illness uh, and with the loneliness. 
I don't mean that other people um, failed to support me, but in the end it was my wife um, who was sick. There was a song that was popular in Seminary Chapel during that period. In your way and in your time. That's how it's going to be in my life. And in your perfect way, I'll rest my weary mind. And as you lead, I'll follow close behind. And in your presence, I will know your peace is mine. In your time, there is rest. There is rest. In your way and in your time, that's how it's going to be in my life. Dear Jesus, soothe me now till all my striving cease. Kiss me with the beauty of your peace. And I will wait and not be anxious at the time. In your time, there is rest. There is rest. And though some prayers I've prayed may seem unanswered yet, you never come too quickly or too late. And I will wait, and I will not regret the time. In your time, there is rest. There is rest. There is rest. And invariably I sang that song, wanting to mean it, aspiring to mean it, knowing it was true, wanting to believe it. Since her illness uh, took, it, took its turn for the worst nearly 30 years ago now, uh, I've missed there being somebody who could give herself unequivocally to me and to whom I could give myself unequivocally. And in this respect, I've been like some single people I know who long that there should be someone with whom they have that mutual commitment. Though I've been, been even more uh, like some married people who lack that reality, even though they're married. And in the past, in my imagination, I've turned several individuals whom I knew into that person. I've spoiled at least one friendship by doing so. Though more often the fantasizing goes on only inside my head. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the other person doesn't know about it. Everyone has thought that I was committed to Anne, heart and soul, and they're not exactly wrong. I had committed my, my life to her, but I didn't exactly succeed in committing my imagination. In addition, while I hadn't committed adultery in the full sense, I had relationships that I shouldn't have had with varying degrees of physical intimacy. And I guess I was craving for the living relationship with somebody of the kind that Anne and I had had um, once. It was two decades before I got a handle um, on this problem and the issues it raises um, and the dynamics of it. Eventually, Anne's problems with memory and other mental functioning meant she had to give up work. Uh, she accepted that actually more easily than I might have expected. She, she used to quote a line from the missionary and spiritual writer Amy Carmichael, in acceptance lieth peace. Somebody commented that maybe when she retired from work she would now have a ministry amongst our seminary students in counselling or in teaching counselling. But the effect of the illness uh, also made that unrealistic. Instead, without trying, she began to have another kind of ministry as she became a more consistent part of the college's life. She loved the students and she had an extraordinary capacity to arouse love in them. She developed a childlike lack of inhibition about asking for what she wanted. And she blessed people in giving us the chance to do things for her. I would sometimes get annoyed with her, particularly if she expressed her discomfort or tiredness as apparent annoyance with me. And I'm ashamed of that fact. But I'm aware how most of the time she was capable of smiling with as much happiness in her eyes as I ever remember. Even though she grieved over losing her independence and being unable to work, she lived life moment by moment, often enjoying the surprises of someone who won't remember what was supposed to happen next. But at the same time, she had to have a urinary catheter fitted and she would have small seizures from time to time. We lived in a big house on the seminary campus and uh, our sons had by now both left home. And a student couple had studies in the house for a while, and so they, more, they saw more of Anne than most people did. 
One of them was later working for a doctoral degree looking at formation for ministry and she comments that knowing Anne in this period was a large part of her formation for ordained ministry. Anne taught her so much, she says, by the way she lived her life. She taught, she taught people to enjoy life and to stop and look and wait and watch and accept and be. These two students, as it happens, um, lived on a narrow boat on a canal and one of my memories is of a time when we took Anne for a ride on the boat. It was quite a contortion, I tell you, lifting the wheelchair onto it, but that's another story. The, the boat, as a canal boat, travelled at about four miles per hour. And that drove me mad. I could cope with standing still, or I could cope with moving at 80 miles an hour, but not with a canal boat's snail-like slowness. In contrast, Anne loved the way she could observe every blade of grass as we passed it. And I realised how people who, who live more slowly can get more out of life. It was two or three years after we moved to the United States that she lost the ability to swallow and over a period of months um, spoke less and less uh, and, and, until she didn't speak at all. And as I've implied, uh, because of the MS, both of these problems were neurological rather than physiological. That is, it wasn't that she knew what she wanted to say, but she couldn't move her lips to say it, like Stephen Hawking's. Her difficulty lay is working out what she wanted to say. I fretted uh, about the implications that had for her relationship with God. Could she relate to God if she couldn't work out what to say? Words are so important to me. Sometime later, a student commented, I always wonder if people like Anne have a special communion with God in their silence. I hope so, he said. I hope so too, but I'd got no conviction about it. There was no evidence of it. I feared that maybe it wasn't true at all. More often I assumed that silence was simply loss. And that this was the price she paid for ministering to people. There's no theological reason why it should be the case that God has a special communion with people in their silence. God is ruthless about using people for the sake of other people when it brings no benefit to the person who's being used. But if so, I knew that God was honouring her ministering in that way and I knew that when she and God decided that enough was enough, God would say, welcome good and faithful servant, come into the joy of your Lord. I nevertheless expressed my worry to a friend who pointed out the fallacy in my assumptions about the downside to her silence. God could, could commune with Anne spirit to spirit even if she didn't have the words to use. And later another colleague commented, I'm amazed at the deep structures in our connection with God at the level of the divine human spirit, especially perhaps when the ill person can't speak. And of course, she and I communicated in a way that didn't just involve words. Almost from the beginning at Fuller, uh, I used to take Anne to chapel. Uh, and over the last four or five years, I took her to the seminary much more, uh, to meetings and events and to lunches. And I then realised that being around the seminary more made it possible for her to exercise her mysterious ministry to people. People I didn't know would stop us on the way across the campus and say hello to her. To me, there was nothing extraordinary about taking her with me as I took her to the beach and to jazz clubs. But to other people, it was unusual. There was no one else wandering around the campus pushed in a wheelchair. I took for granted the unusual nature of our relationship, but it was less instinctive for other people to do so. Now, the United States is a post-colonial culture, which means, which means it has a love-hate relationship with its European background, like Australia and New Zealand, I guess. I am mostly the beneficiary of people's undue regard for a British accent in the United States, which makes them think that I'm talking sense just because I have this accent. <laughs> 
Um, I'm also the beneficiary of students' appreciation for, for my quirkiness, my lack of dress sense, uh, and my inclination to question ideas that they hold dearest and that they assume are biblical. <laughs> the students that I mentioned at the very beginning uh, commented on this undue regard for me as a British professor, but she then added, what I did not expect was to have my life changed by the mostly silent woman who sat in a wheelchair who was his wife. Anne Golden Gay was a steady presence in my fuller experience. So much of what John was bore the marks of her life impressed upon his. As he would teach, it often felt as if she were there in the classroom with us. Another student commented after she died, I was thinking last night as you talked to Anne that even now she continues to minister to others. I know that if I were in her place, I would want my life to affect others, to make them think and stir their hearts. A friend of hers uh, used sometimes to come and sit with her when I had to be at a meeting or something that I couldn't take her to. Um, and in a chapel talk, this woman spoke of what she had learned through Anne. Uh, she was the, 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 as it were, the preacher in chapel, uh, but she, and she had Anne sitting with her at the front of the chapel, um, and she shared an, an excerpt from her own journal that's written as if she's speaking to Anne, who is there with her, though, at the front. And she describes an occasion when she came to sit with Anne. You whimpered and cried for a while. John wasn't there to take over or make it better. You, we were alone, you and I. As I held your hand, I couldn't help but feel helpless. Helplessness. I don't like that word, much less the feelings attached to it. My worldview teaches me to be in control, to be strong and independent. I can compete with the best of them and be successful. I don't need anybody. I work hard at what I do and I can pull myself up by my bootstraps. But Anne, you are helpless, vulnerable and fragile. By your very presence you bring out those fears in me. And I realise that my world isn't that safe and I am not in as much control as I think I am or want to be. In that helplessness I began to sing and holding hands with you I realised we were not alone. I was with you, and you were with me, and God was with us. In your discomfort, in my song, in our clasped hands, we three were together. Then peace came over your face and to my heart. Emmanuel. You teach me that to be human is to live in a world that is neither perfect nor safe. You invite me to trust God and live my life in complete dependence on him in whom we live, move and have our being. On another occasion the same woman observed, Anne teaches me that to be human is to experience vulnerability, weakness and fragility. She invites me to embrace all of my humanity, the strong, stable parts along with the weak, fragile parts. Another student also comments on her own fear. I visited the Golden Gate's home quite often during my first year or two at Fuller. I often felt uncomfortable when I approached Anne to say hello because I didn't know what to say to someone who couldn't speak to me. But I wanted to push past my fear and acknowledge her just as I would any other person. At times I felt distant from the other people who frequented the Golden Gate's, most likely because they were cultured, articulate and intelligent. When they spoke about theology and art and films and music, I really, I really didn't have a lot to add to the conversation. When I finally did have something to say, I remained quiet and paralysed. I had been silent for, silent for so long that it was hard to change the pattern. This was strange for me because I considered myself an extrovert and fairly social. I realised that there was no longer just one Anne Golding Gay in the room. I began to feel what it must be like to be Anne, with so many thoughts and feelings being experienced 
yet at the same time an inability to communicate them. If there was anyone in the room that I could relate to, it was Anne. I wished someone had acknowledged me, the silent figure at the dinner table or around the TV in the midst of a bustling conversation. I wished that someone could have seen that my silence did not mean disinterest or stupidity. It was scary to identify myself with Anne's seemingly lifeless figure. But by doing so, I experienced a silent solidarity with her. For that experience of being able to relate to Anne, I'm grateful. Theologically, what this pushes people towards is indeed that centeredness in grace that Rod has just referred to. The phrase came from the, uh, an email that another Old Testament professor, Gerald Jansen, included uh, in, in an email to me when he recalls coming to Nottingham to lecture uh, some years earlier. One of the indelible memories he took away, he said, was of Anne in her wheelchair, so clearly held in everyone's affection and her self-communicating a centeredness in grace. Communicating this centeredness must say something about her inner being, something subjective within her. It also says something about who she was objectively. There's a sense in which she had no option but to rely on God's grace. She couldn't do anything. She embodied the fact that it is possible to be a human being and not to be able to do anything. It is not doing that constituted her. It could not be. She was constituted by grace. She reminded people that God embraces us in our brokenness and our limitations. And she did so especially as she affirmed a centeredness in God's grace, not a dependence on what we do. And further, she did draw love from people. Stanley Howells has commented that we don't want to be faced by people with handicap and chronic illness. If that's true as a generalisation, then many people in our Christian communities, church and seminary, and in our secular communities, jazz clubs and restaurants, proved glorious exceptions. Anne drew love out of them, love for her and also love for me. I could easily feel that a grey-haired man accompanying someone in a wheelchair is out of place in many of the clubs that we went to in Hollywood. Yet people never made us feel uncomfortable. Uh, two hefty bouncers lifted Anne in her wheelchair onto the wings of the stage at the Troubadour Club in Hollywood because they didn't think she'd be able to see very well from the floor. I said this to someone and she commented that our life simply illustrated the nature of marriage. Two people just hanging on to each other, for better or for worse, because this is who we are and what we do. And this person went on to say that it was a stance that was counter-cultural, counter not only to the culture of the world, but of the church too. Now we weren't trying to give Christian witness to the nature of marriage. We were just being married. What else could we do? But if it came across as countercultural in a positive way, I'm grateful that Anne made me do it. For the first third of our time um, as a married couple, our marriage had been, in a sense, quite ordinary. There's a sense in which, in this last third, oddly, it became ordinary again in the sense that I came unconsciously to accept it as normal for us. It was what it was. Weird by other people's standards, but normal for us. While I did look after Anne, we did the things that other people do. We went to a couple of movies or concerts each week. We had people to dinner and we went out to dinner. We went to the beach for lunch. I guess for me it was part of my coping mechanism going out for music was a selfish indulgence on my part as it helped to keep me sane. But I could also rationalise that music reaches the parts other things don't reach. There was at least a chance that Anne was enjoying it. In a sense, 
it wasn't we who tried to live an ordinary life because I became the person who had to make the decisions for the two of us whether it was a decision about what to have to dinner for dinner or whether it was a decision to move to California it was really hard uh, not being able to know what Anne liked and what she didn't like what she was thinking I often said that we will spend the first 10 years in heaven with her telling me about all the things I did wrong <laughs> I appreciated it when someone said that on the contrary she will want to spend the first hundred years telling me about all the things I did right <laughs> in class I would often refer to Anne in unplanned ways because I realized that she provided an illustration of a particular point but there are things that I always made a point of saying in class one is that when people ask me what is my favorite book in the Bible I say Ecclesiastes now this is not the right answer you're supposed to say John or Romans but I wrote some years ago about Ecclesiastes my wife Anne is lying on the sofa at the other end of the room to safeguard against getting pressure sores a few weeks ago we received a Christmas card from one of her psychotherapy patients in England now herself a therapist who remembers the sessions she with the sessions she had with Anne and looks back on them as a decisive shaping influence on her life today Anne cannot remember what country she lives in nor what day it is nor what are the names of the two caregivers who have shared in looking after her over, for over two years nor what is the name of the grandson who brought her such joy when he was here a few weeks ago from England she is unable to swallow or speak she was watching the television news though I'm not sure how much she takes in on the news we've been here we've been hearing of the terrible cost of the Russian invasion of Chechnya of the suffering of the local people and of the Russian bodies surrounding their tanks the pictures were too grim to show us we were told in a moment I will take her out for a walk in her wheelchair in the warm winter Sun and we will have an ice cream and if we're lucky she'll be able to eat a little of it and as I push her back up the hill to our apartment I will sing silly songs and pretend that I'm not going to make it to the top and she will laugh it's not enough but it's not nothing and it's certainly not to be despised it is a gift from God that is what Ecclesiastes says just before she died a student wrote to me a classmate of mine and I have both heard our wives remark that we are better husbands during the quarters we're in your classes I don't know exactly all that all that they mean by it by that but I suspect says the student that it is in no small part due to the reminder you offer to cherish the little joys the brief and fleeting wondrous moments that still spring up in the midst of stress and difficulty indeed the problem of blessing is greater than the problem of evil in that last remark he is referring to a comment I sometimes make when people are fretting about the, the problem of evil it's odd that people who are not suffering often seem to fret more about this problem than people who are suffering I had to do a radio uh, interview this morning and Rod and Fiona assured me um, told me what the questions were I would be asked and they were both totally wrong uh, the only question really the guy wanted to talk about was the problem of evil uh, we went to the Philippines Kathleen reminded us uh, last night uh, when we went to the Philippines a few months ago what did they want to talk about in the Philippines the problem of evil it's, it's something kind of pervades in our culture for reasons that are not particularly obvious especially as, as I say it's usually people like our students in Fuller who have roofs over their heads and homes to go to and food to eat and who are physically healthy at least and, and they fret about the problem of evil what on earth are we to make instead of the fact that there is so much good in the world isn't that at least as striking as the fact that there is so much suffering and evil 
A Fuller graduate talked about Anne on her blog uh, after, she, after Anne died, and she included this quotation from something I wrote on Job. What we may be able to infer is that calamities do have, like Job's, do have explanations, even if we don't know what they are. Because there is another feature of the story of Job that delights me every time I think about it, not least because it establishes a similarity between, between Job and us. It is that Job himself never knows about chapters one and two of his book. So he goes through his pain the same way as we do. And he illustrates how the fact that we don't know what might explain our suffering, what purpose God might have in it, doesn't constitute the slightest suggestion that the suffering, the suffering has no explanation. I can't imagine the story that makes it okay for God to have made Anne go through what she's been through. But I can imagine that there is such a story. Being wheelchair bound as she was for the last 12 years of her life makes a person susceptible to pneumonia and Anne had pneumonia four or five times. Four times, experts assured us that she would not recover. But four times, she and or God decided otherwise. A, a colleague later commented that the capacity of those who are seriously ill and, una and unable to speak, even facing death, to determine that now is not the time, along with God, is remarkable. Each time, it was as if God had acted to keep her ministry going and as if she had agreed to take it on again. Or maybe the other way around. She had agreed and God had acted. A seminary chap chaplain testified to it a few, a few weeks after one of those episodes uh, of pneumonia, uh, after a chapel service in which we had celebrated Holy Communion. Anne couldn't receive the actual bread and wine, uh, of course, but I asked the chaplain to come and pray for her. And the chaplain later told me, when I touched Anne to pray for her and offer her the body of Christ, she jolted. I really felt she knew me and was responding to this offering of Christ that we were extending. It was a deeply relational moment for me. I felt she gave me a small gift, an offering of life to our body of Christ, and a reminder to me that God embraces me through my limited and broken self. I thought of it later in the context of another sermon by another professor later about recognising signs of life in the midst of tragedy, sickness and the like. I felt deeply sorrowful, she says. I remembered your sorrow, yet I knew God's presence with us in blessing Anne and God's reaching out to me through Anne. It was only a little while later that she caught pneumonia again, and this time she didn't recover. Uh, it was three years ago, two weeks ago, as I say. I had been due to preach in our church the following Sunday, but I asked to be excused, though if I had preached, the New Testament lesson from 2 Corinthians 12 that was set for that day would have been impossible to resist. And I realised yesterday in looking at the uh, lectionary passages for next Sunday that I have to preach on, that it's that Sunday again. Um, uh, that it's slightly different in terms of date, but because of Easter moving and things like that, the way the lectionary works out is slightly different. Um, and uh, this coming Sunday, I don't know, I shall handle this, <laughs> that we shall be reading the passages that we read this, the, um, the Sunday after she died. Uh, Rod has already, already read uh, Eugene Peterson of that passage where Paul says, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. At first I didn't think of it as a gift and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that and then he told me, my grace is enough, it's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Through her life, Anne had served God 
and served other people, though in changing ways. Three times and more, we and other people asked God to remove this handicap. But God said, my strength comes into its own in her weakness. And things people had said and said after her death testified to the way she ministered silently to hundreds of people. Now one of my colleagues has, uh, has commented that my experience as a pastor does not lead me to romanticise such circumstances as the ones that Anne and I lived with. Or to romanticise an ongoing disability like hers. Our daughter-in-law remembers an occasion some years previously when we were pushing Anne through in the wheelchair through Pasadena and Anne cried out, this is horrible! But for much of her latter years, she was more content than in the years when, the, when she was relatively fit. She became less driven, less liable to anxiety. Nevertheless, it had troubled me in the previous year or two before she died that she'd sometimes seemed not quite so content and at peace as before. And I had thought, Lord, do you think she's fulfilled this vocation for long enough? Couldn't you let her rest now? I didn't quite say this to God because when I say such things to God, God is inclined to reply, what I do with Anne is between Anne and me, so shut up. <laughs> but perhaps God heard me anyway. In her life, God's strength sure came into its own in her weakness. A day or two after her death, uh, one of our friends in England spoke in an email of his vivid memory of the day you told me of Anne's illness all those years ago and of your faith then that God was in it and with you and always would be. 43 years previously it had been and God had been in it and had been with her and with me all through. Amongst these emails that I've received from time to time over the years from people commenting on what Anne meant to them, and particularly uh, after her death, um, was one from a graduate who commented on the recent passing of two former Fuller professors. Two giants, she called them. This graduate goes on, Anne too was a giant, and her life instructed so many of us. As I have thought about Anne these past days, I've been struck by a passage in Philippians chapter 1 that for me describes the kind of impact Anne has had on my life. The Apostle Paul writes of a different sort of bondage than that which robbed Anne of her movement and speech. But the truth of how that bondage impacted others is the same. He writes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. From England after she died, someone commented on a funeral service for someone else, at which the sermon had taken up the line from Hebrews, though dead, yet he speaks. And this person observed that this is true for Anne too. Indeed, in these latter years, it has been true that, though silent, yet she speaks. 
we had a memorial service for her in England and the day after I then came home back to Los Angeles one of my sons commented in an email that he had been overwhelmed by things people had said to him about Anne or had written in emails or written on cards they'd made him see her from a different perspective because to him she was just my mum I was thrilled that to him she was just my mum but I was also thrilled that he had got, that he had got to see her from this other perspective to my surprise over the next few days I too became overwhelmed by all those messages about the way Anne had affected people uh, I'd often thought and said that her having her ministry to people helped, helped to take the edge off the awfulness of the illness but in the back of my mind I'd also wondered whether I was exaggerating its significance to make me feel better now it transpired that I didn't know the half of it that realization did make even more pressing the question what I was to be about from now on because my key vocation hadn't been being a professor or being a pastor it had been uh, looking after Anne and letting Anne exercise her ministry and that vocation was now over uh, I didn't feel angry at her death um, on my account or my anger is repressed if the pop psychology uh, is right that you're supposed to feel angry when somebody dies but I began to feel something like anger uh, at her ministry being terminated as well as bewilderment, bewilderment about what the future was to mean for me at the same time I also thought and I had to remind myself that I had been thinking about her ministry becoming very wearing on her and I'd, be asking, I'd been asking how long she had to continue fulfilling it and I was glad for her to be able to rest until resurrection day I didn't dream that I would find a new identity and a new vocation with my new wife Kathleen who I'm so glad to have with me and with whom I indeed have a new kind of ministry in the seminary and in our church uh, where she loves to be the pastor's wife a few months after Anne died uh, a woman in my class uh, was shortly to marry another student uh, but in the ninth of the 11 weeks um, of the quarter I received from her the kind of email that professors often receive at that stage of the quarter to say that she didn't think that she could meet the deadline for turning in papers <laughs> except that in her case the reason was that she'd just been told that she had a brain tumour she was to have surgery in two weeks and in that connection they had brought forward their wedding to the following Saturday she later told me that they had been influenced by something I said in a lecture on Jeremiah entering into Christian marriage is one of the most magnificent statements of hope we can make in this world topped only by bringing children into the world I think the latter part of that observation comes from Stanley Howells again I commented to a friend that this more recent bride was such a young slip of a thing to be facing what she is facing but the friend was herself about to have a biopsy and she responded girls are made of steel it's a scam that we look so fragile I knew that that was true of that woman as it was true of this bride and as it had been true of Anne one of my colleagues introduced the brought forward marriage service by saying this there are at least two things I have decided to do that it turns out I had no idea what I was saying when I said I would do them one was to follow Jesus the other was to get married all of us she said make commitments make promises to care and love other people to join our lives with others and yet we have no real idea what we are doing when we gather for weddings 
such uncertainties are often in the background and the focus is on the couple and their love for one another our shared hopes for their future sometimes we can indulge the illusion that it is our human love in the form of romance that sustains and makes such promises possible this wedding the wedding of the girl with the brain tumour is different Adrian and Nathan do not have the luxury of pretending that they know what they are doing today because they are acutely aware that they are not in control of their future they do not know what the diagnosis will be or the nature of Adrian's recovery Adrian and Nathan have no idea what they are promising when they link their lives together in their vows and we have no idea what we are doing when we promise by our presence here at this Christian wedding to sustain support and protect this marriage as their community but Christian marriage is not about what we know nor about what we are able to do to keep our promises nor about our ability to sustain ourselves or control our futures rather Christian marriage is about the one who invites us to make such promises it is a celebration of the God who by his faithfulness makes such crazy commitments possible and most importantly infuses them with the deepest joy in the keeping of them Nathan and Adrian welcome you into their future not because they are, sh they are sure what it entails but because they trust in the one who transforms foolish promises to love another into the wisdom that nourishes an abundant life when the woman had the operation for the tumour a week later the doctors couldn't find anything something like what my colleague said though in that um, talk at the beginning of the marriage service is more broadly true for people who are disabled and for their partners and friends and families we welcome each other into our future not, not because we are sure what it entails but, be, but because we trust in the one who transforms foolish promises to love one another into the wisdom that nourishes an abundant life. <laughs>